Well, this is fantastic. Thank you for joining us for this very special Google Hangout. We've got to start off with a, with a quick apology. Clearly, we had some technology challenges when we tried to do this last week, and some of these challenges aren't unusual or unfamiliar to a lot of enterprise customers when their applications in the cloud don't quite work so well. My name is Greg Nierman. I'm the HDS Technology Evangelist, and I'm joined with the expert panel here this week. And I'd like each of them to introduce themselves. Sunil, we'll start off with you. Hi. Uh, good morning, uh, and welcome, everybody, to this Google Hangout. My name is Sunil Chavan. I'm Senior Director for Solution Sales for Asia Pacific. I look after most of the solution areas from Converge, Cloud, Big Data, uh, content activities uh, for Asia Pacific uh, uh, with HDS. That's Thanks. fantastic. Sam. Uh, yes, good day. Sam Johnston here, uh, dialing in from Sydney. I uh, recently uh, returned to Australia to join Computer Sciences Corporation, CFC, as their CTO for Australia New Zealand. And uh, happy to join you today to talk about uh, uh, virtualization and, and cloud and, and uh, migration challenges and so on. So, and go. I'm really glad you're joining us, Sam. I mean, you got a, such a rich background going back to Equinix and Google and other companies. And I can't think of somebody better suited to discuss some of these challenges the customers ex are experiencing than you. So thank you for joining. Thanks for having us. JP, you're up next. Hey, uh, so my name is JP. Thanks for having me as well. Um, I'm in VMware uh, based out of the Singapore office. I look after pretty much all of the products in the software defined data center or everything outside of our end user computing space. So this is the compute network and uh, storage virtualization as well as some of the management pieces as well as our hybrid cloud strategies. Uh, and I'm a product marketing manager and a product manager for all of those products within the ASEAN region. Thanks. Wow. A lot of responsibility there, JP. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we all know, for the past decade, virtualization has transformed the way we use and our expectations of the data center. What was once considered an underutilized server resource is now a critical piece of infrastructure. Virtualization is also responsible for running multiple machine instances, managing resources, and rapid application deployment across both hybrid and private clouds. In this hangout, we're going to explore how businesses can address governance, and security concerns for large mission-critical clouds. We'll also consider whether the same technologies can be le leveraged across private and hybrid clouds, and whether an appliance approach makes sense for all workloads. And I want to just start this off. I want to take a big step back from that. And I'll, I'll start off with you, Sam. I I'm just curious because, I mean, especially with your vast experience, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're seeing enterprises experiencing as they transition from legacy to cloud in general? Yeah, I think that the um, you know the big the biggest challenge is that it's a completely different way of of, of um, you know, solving problems with IT. In the same way that moving from mainframe to client server was a huge change, uh, moving from now client server to cloud is also uh, a, a massive shift from everything from you know how you divide, design and build applications. How you operate them, we've got this whole you know DevOps uh, idea, um, and then and then how you actually use them as well, how you connect using uh, web interfaces, mobile interfaces, and so on as well. So it completely changes everything um, about uh, about how we use IT. Um, so that's that's you know, enterprises really need to need to uh, you know d develop those skills, hire those skills, um, you know keep keep the legacy infrastructure running. Also introduce a host of private component, and then where possible use the public cloud as well. Um, so you know, build a build a hybrid IT uh, environment that's seamlessly and securely integrated. And I think that's the biggest challenge, right? Is to identify the right tools and resources, and how that's going to impact your application experience for your for your end users in your enterprise. JP, you know, VMware is so central for so many enterprises, and a lot of enterprises are being guided for, for the cloud strategy because they've got this virtualization platform already in place. And so I imagine there's a, there's a big challenge there for, for, for you and for VMware as far as how do you migrate, not necessarily migrate, it's probably not the right word, but how do you leverage legacy infrastructures that, that with applications that are sitting inside of VMware and, and virtualized machines and make them cloud ready? What are some of the challenges you're seeing with that? Yeah, um, probably some of the biggest challenges that we see from our customers in this space is, to, as Sam pointed out, do they want to kind of lift and shift some of those client-server applications 
or are they really looking to build some of the new cloud native applications using microservices and DevOps and all these you know, other new technologies that are in there? For the customers that need to maintain their existing legacy, which is pretty much everybody, um, by leveraging a virtualization platform, uh, regardless of who that is, right, you can then take those components, kind of pick them up and move them into the cloud, but then that brings a whole host of other issues that they now have to start thinking about around compliance, around security. Um, am I able to then you know, move workloads into and out of the cloud? So there's, there's all these different concerns that, that everyone's really focused on right now. Absolutely. And Sunil, we see this uh, from the HDS side pretty frequently because we're constantly engaged with customers that are trying to balance um, the benefits of, of uh, perhaps off-prem or, or off-prem technology that they've acquired from us and they're looking to understand the advantages and the complications that go with that transition to cloud. What are some of the, the, the feedback that you're getting from the folks you're talking to? Absolutely. I guess, uh, well, as, as highlighted by Sam and JP, right, I think virtualization uh, is, is definitely one of the key things. You know, we've been uh, working with VMware for the last 15-odd you know, years. Uh, we have put together our storage infrastructure, virtualized storage infrastructure for most of our customers. And the next question came that, you know, how do we kind of look at a converged infrastructure to balance most of our different uh, multiple workloads? Uh, initially, people thought, you know, putting a stack really is a good approach. But eventually, the way we see it, an application-aware converged infrastructure, which kind of be on an on-premise and off-prem kind of a model, is the way to go. And that has really brought a lot of activities closer. It's really improved uh, the mission-critical application ROI or time to market in a, in a quick way and reduce the operational cost. I think that is the biggest mm -hmm. benefit we see our customers getting and then the reduction in operation costs, what they see. So a lot of customers started like more like a private cloud with us and then maybe eventually now they're looking at how do we, as you pointed out before, how do you look at hybrid or a, eventually even integrated with a public cloud approach, uh, but having the control and uh, application kind of natively driving it, the end-to-end -end process uh, through VMware console and the infrastructure attached with it. So I think uh, that, that amalgamation now I see very clearly kind of happening. Uh, a lot of customers are using that now across uh, Asia Pacific for us uh, uh, and going in that direction to the next step of bringing the public cloud also in play. That's fantastic. And Sam, I, we've been talking about technology in context to that transition to leveraging cloud applications, but as much as it's about technology, it really is about people and, and about how you're kind of architected and, and orchestrating what, what your common mission is within your enterprise environment to whether you succeed or fail on this. What are, what are some of the failures, the non-technology failures or challenges that you see customers experiencing? Yeah, well, I think that one of the, you know, at the heart of it, it's really just moving from IT as products to IT as services, right? So previously, uh, you would buy a whole bunch of servers and, and software and, and, and uh, your antivirus and all of the bits and pieces that you'd need to, to build a solution. So the, the challenges to moving to a service as well, uh, and, and as such I would say that you know, this world of, of system integration that I've moved into recently is now more kind of a world of services integration. Um, it, it, how do you consume those things and, and how do you you know, even for the for the bean counters, how do you uh, how do you track them? How do you pay for them? How do you budget them? Um, you know, moving from uh, these big you know, waterfall waterfall projects where you say this is you know we're going from kind of A to B. Um, this is this is how we're going to get there. These are all the steps. That's what it's going to cost. Uh, you know, it's kind of a, a, I guess like a trajectory based approach. Um, moving to an agile approach where you say okay, well let's let's that's the basic direction we want to go. Let's go there for a week or two. Take you know stop and ha take stock of where we are, you know uh, readjust and then and then keep going. So the, even down at the kind of the the foot soldier level, you're still you're still um, uh, changing completely the way that you actually manage what are, what can be quite large and, and complex projects. Um, from the user point of view, a lot of this has been driven by uh, you know this kind of shadow IT department, consumerization of IT. People have better tools. You know back in the day, you'd have to go to work to use a fax machine. You'd have to you'd go to work to do international direct dial. Um, nowadays, enterprises look at what consumers are doing. They've got Skype, they've got Facebook, and they're like, how can we get that technology ourselves? Mm -hmm. So consumers are kind of leading the way, and when they go to work, they're being challenged you know, they're, they're to do their job because 
you know, the, the IT departments, which have traditionally been a department of no kind of getting in the way, are now having to, to come and be an enabler of, uh, of this kind of user experience. It's people actually choosing their employer um, based on their IT system. They're saying, look, if you've got, you know, uh, I want to use um, Office 365 instead of uh, you know, notes or, or some other some other internal system. I've heard cases where, where people have actually you know potentially turned down jobs and things based on on the types of tools they're using. Um, so it, it it really affects everybody. I think the shift from product to service and uh, and a lot of it is non-technical. You know there are technical issues, but a lot of it really is non-technical. It really is. And you know, one of the things. Sam, it, it, we've all, it, it's almost beat to death now, the, the public versus private uh, cloud debate, because really we're transitioning to a world where the folks that are consuming cloud resources aren't going to be conscious of whether it's on-prem, off-prem, it's just cloud, it's just there, it's just available. How is CSC adding value to their customers for that cloud experience? What does it look like technically? Is it on-prem, is it off-prem? And let's get into biz cloud just a little bit here to to understand that value proposition that CSC is bringing to market. Yeah, so I mean we've got our own uh, our own cloud offerings. We've got public versions of that. We've got private uh, uh, versions of it. We're single tenant, multi tenant. We've got uh, um, you know, clouds that we're building for uh, for um, community clouds, for government, for banking, for for health, and so on. Uh, it's all under the biz cloud banner, uh, but there are a number of different uh, you know different um, uh, types of, of uh, hardware and virtualization and so on that we're using for that depending on the on the customer but it really is a case of of choosing the right tool for the job so it may be BizCloud, it may be Amazon it may be Azure it may be you know, vCloud Air or some combination and I think the thing is that the idea that you had to choose a vendor and you, you, know, you were an Amazon shop um, where we're an Azure shop that's kind of gone people are uh, they accept that there's a hybrid IT and people are really you know, pushing towards that legacy uh, private and public um, split. But they're also realizing that it's possible to, to have you know, one department using Amazon and one department using Azure and so on. To make it all work together so that it's seamless, uh, you, you need to have the connectivity under control. That's what I spent the last five years at Equinix doing was working on direct connections to cloud providers and you know, building these cloud ecosystems and so on. And it's now possible to completely bypass the internet, which is where the source of most of your problems with latency and bandwidth and security and so on come from. So you as a user don't really notice. You've essentially grafted these massive, you know, multi-million machine public clouds onto your LAN and effectively onto your laptop. You know, we had these stickers at Google that were, you know, my other, my other computer is a data center. Well, <laughs> you know, that's the case now. You can sit here in an office and and you can uh, you can um, do work locally, but you can easily just drag and drop it into a cloud, uh, and and you know start to work um, start a thousand machines to to calculate your your problem. Um, so, it, and it all it is it's all seamless. You don't know if it's in the basement, you don't know if it's in another country, or if it's in a multi-tenant data center. No, I think and you don't really want to care about that either. I mean, you you just want to be able to do your job and let the infrastructure exactly. be orchestrated and all the compliance and the regulations that go with that to be automatic and, and, and so the experience is completely transparent and, and frictionless as possible. Exactly, and that's exactly why uh, such a, a key part of the strategy over here is agility. I'm actually sitting in the, in the old service mesh offices um, in Sydney now uh, because we've got a tool that can manage uh, those, those um, your hybrid cloud environments. You can do things like say, you know what, the policy engine won't, you know, the computer says, no, you can't put that customer data out into the public cloud. Um, or you can't have that thing running for too long, or you know, it, it actually gives you some amount of control over something which has been to date fairly uncontrollable um, because it's been purchased by individual individuals and individual departments and so on on corporate credit cards, uh, which is you know half the half the problem. Half the, yeah, that's half the challenge. You know, JP, I was at VMworld uh, in the U.S. Uh, just a few weeks ago. And it was interesting to hear the keynote speeches around you know one cloud. But really, it's not just really about one cloud. There's a, it's kind of a, of a layer underneath it. It's much more complex than that. What's VMware's approach and strategy as you're communicating to customers as they explore these new options that are available to them? Yeah, the, the one cloud moniker kind of works in some markets and doesn't in other. I mean, the idea behind it is not that we're trying to say you have to choose one cloud provider. 
uh, right. in one solution in order to make it work. It's the idea that regardless of who you're buying cloud from, or who, whether it's on-prem or off-prem or a combination of both, that you should treat it as one cloud, and that it should be managed and secured as one cloud. Uh, and this is kind of where we're coming in from a management perspective, and we're saying, you know, as Sam had mentioned, you know, if you want to, one department wants to procure on, on Azure, and another on AWS, and another on-prem, or wherever it might sit, um, you want to be able to give IT control to be able to understand where that is, what the best cost benefits are of placing those different workloads out there, um, and then really the, 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 the ultimate dream is to be able to provision uh, as well as bring it back, right? So from a single kind of dashboard, whether it's IT owned or business unit owned, however that might be, that someone can say, okay, I need a new SAP instance, I want to deploy it somewhere, let me look at my cost uh, comparison across whether I do it on-prem or, or off-prem and, and, and some of the service providers that we've already connected to, uh, and find the cheapest one and click go, and it will automatically provision. Um, that's kind of the dream as to where a lot of these organizations are looking to go, um, and today there's still a little bit of work in order to make that, that happen. I think this is some of the focus areas that, that organizations are looking to to really put some emphasis on, because the idea is maybe cheaper today, it may be cheaper tomorrow, depending on where I go, uh, and they want to be able to offer those. How big is the challenge for? Obviously, um, VMware's got a very broad I install base. How big is that challenge? I think I think we use the term you know lift and shift, but really, what does that look like for? How big of a transition is that for somebody that's that, that's used to working f with vSphere, right? And, and now they're migrating that. What does that what does that look like, I guess, from the IT side? Because on the front side of that, that should be completely seamless and, like I said before, frictionless from a, from a consumption perspective. Yeah. Uh, it, it's going to depend 100% on the provider that is, is offering these services, right? Uh, we work with a lot of service providers in order to, to build a vSphere base or a VMware base uh, cloud. Uh, mm -hmm. This is, you know, VMware owned as well as what we call the vCloud Air Network Partners. And we have about 4,000 worldwide that have built their cloud-based services uh, based on vSphere. And when you do that, you have the exact same experience on-prem as well as off-prem, and it allows you to do things like move into and out of cloud services as needed. Um, the problem is for the organizations that don't leverage uh, those, the, the service providers that don't leverage that VMware base, um, essentially, they're winding up having to basically rebuild, right? Um, they have to take all of the components that they've built and then rebuild them into one of these other service providers, and that's mm -hmm. the trouble that that organizations are facing. It's you know the Hotel California story, right? You can you can check in, but you can never leave, right? So the idea is that I can build into a service provider, but if I really want to choose another one, I have to my choice is to either build another, you know, rebuild it again, or bring it back home somehow. Uh, and that today, that technology is just not really seamless unless you choose, you know, one kind of platform in order to support that. Understood. Understood. Sunil, so obviously from an HDS perspective, we come at this, you know, obviously uh, we, we work with uh, cloud service partners, we work with vendors like VMware, but what's the reality that you're seeing as far as how customers are making that transition and how are they leveraging and taking advantage of HDS services and our resources to do that? Sure. So basically two things. One is, I think, three or four years back, I think uh, all our customers were like, oh, we want to have a private cloud. You know, we work with VMware or we work with uh, Microsoft uh, infrastructure and we want to put that whole thing together. We went through that phase. That question doesn't arise anymore. I think, the, uh, I think it's really, Sam has put it very clearly, hybrid IT is, is the way to go. And customers are very clearly saying that, okay, you know, I have these different applications, different workloads, different business dynamics, which can change over a period of time, and I need to manage this in a simpler way. If you can offer that end-to-end -end thought process where tomorrow I, uh, I want to be in a hybrid cloud, getting into a particular data center, or I want to be in a public cloud, integrating certain applications with public cloud, we want to be open. Uh, two things very clearly are kind of separating this thing, and I always bring example of Amazon. Amazon offers two services, NetNet, right? There's a simple storage service, which is around object storage. There is infrastructure service where virtual machines, where people can use these things. And I think customers get a sense that if I need a cloud which can look at my files or various object storage content activities, or I need infrastructure as a service which can work with 
either VMware or Hyper-V. And if you can offer both integrated together with an application-aware thought process, I think that's where we have differentiated as HDS to a lot of our customers. We are offering this in-house. We are already orchestrating different cloud. I think what JP was saying, right? If our content store, which is on a converged infrastructure, I can actually store data on Amazon AWS and manage the data management layer on our object storage. And then the customer says, no, now Amazon is too expensive for me. I want to move to Google two months down the line. I can actually pull out the data from orchestration from Amazon and help him to migrate to this thing. So in the object storage world, we manage that transition and the data migration thought process very easily for them. I think on an infrastructure as a virtual machine, and that's what JP was highlighting, there is that uh, uh, rip and replace thought process going on. And that's where we work very closely with CSE in terms of you know, giving that business cloud thought process. We have CSE, there are some things being put together with uh, uh, SI partners like Infosys as well, where that we, we align our cloud messages, uh, messaging and our cloud thought process. And uh, that's why business cloud from CSE really kind of help us to put that overall approach together. Some very happy customers in the region uh, working with us and CSE uh, taking it on. And, and that's really a good uh, way we are going to kind of take this forward. Absolutely. And Sam, I guess that, that brings it back to you. You know, people throw around the term hybrid cloud pr pretty pretty freely. And I, depending on which camp you in, you're in, you kind of hear different, you know, versions of how easy a hybrid cloud is to actually run. You know, they, I've, I've heard some analysts and pundits say, well, I've heard of hybrid cloud. I've, ne I've never actually seen one work. What's the reality for us? Can you do a level set for us about what, what a hybrid cloud looks like in and when wouldn't a hybrid cloud be a good option for, for a customer? Uh, yeah, look, I mean, I think that, um, you know, it, it's a hybrid cloud, hybrid IT in general. Uh, there, um, you know, there are cases where you have more private infrastructure or more public infrastructure. Uh, there's cases where you will, for example, have a, a, um, a front end. I was speaking to one of the banks who has a complete front end banking platform, a financial services platform on a large public cloud provider, uh, which is then seamlessly integrated with a back office system, a, a legacy system. You can do the reverse as well. You can store your data in cloud and and, uh, and kind of have a have a, 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 a front end. Uh, so Netflix, for example, do this. They run their own, uh, their own content um, delivery network. Uh, so there's a number of different ways that you can, um, you can do it. Uh, it really depends, I think, a lot on the application. Uh, traditional legacy applications build the reliability into the hardware rather than the software. So if, you've, if you're building these next generation applications on, you know, scale out, non-relational data stores and so on, um, that, that can, uh, you know, that are kind of cloud native, uh, then it makes, it makes um, a lot more sense to use a, uh, a commodity base or a public cloud service. Um, but typically, you know, you find even within, within one application, you'll find a combination. Uh, you might have a, you know, even a mainframe, which has then got a, 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 a data storage, a database, a data lake sitting in front of it um, for, uh, for for serving the web or for um, for analytics, uh, because you generally don't want external users coming in and hitting your, your mainframe directly. Um, so it really is just a case of using the right tool for the job, I think. That's fantastic. I just want to take a break here and just remind everybody uh, who's watching us hang out live or even after the event. Uh, if you have any questions, please add them to the event page here, and uh, we've got some folks that are uh, communicating with us back channel, and, and we'll feed those questions back to us because we want to incorporate as much of that as possible. Even a comment, even if you don't have a question, if you got a comment, throw it out there, and, and we'll stew on it here. JP, I want to go back to you because because I think hybrid cloud is one of the, the the value propositions that customers are looking for in their virtualization solution. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing a big shift in, in the movement from on-prem to off-prem uh, within our own our own space, right? I think the numbers uh, from a recent survey were around 16% of IT budgets are IT known budgets, so not the shadow IT budgets, but IT known budgets are currently being spent uh, in off-prem services, whether that's software as a service or, or public cloud or something along those natures. And we're expecting this to, that to double in, in just over two years. Um, so getting a hold of how organizations are going to leverage that and where they want to place, um, the, in, 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 in our case, the hybrid cloud, really is a big focus of, of where we're trying to, to steer the company, right? 
So we have some offerings uh, in a public slash hybrid cloud, but realistically, we want to be able to enable our, you know, we have a lot of customers, right, as you, as you know, 500,000 or so customers. We want to find a way that we can enable them to leverage uh, those cloud economics, and, and, and realistically, it's regardless of which uh, platform they choose to use, so. That's right. You know, one of the things that um, I, I attend a number of conferences, occasionally do uh, presentations at, at conferences, and there's one hot button word that comes up, uh, especially in, I would say in the, in the last year. And you guys probably have all heard this a thousand times. It's containers. Yeah. And it's it's funny if you've got a presentation, it's got the title containers on it. You're, you're guaranteed to have a full room first of all, <laughs> but you're also guaranteed to get some pretty basic, pretty basic level questions around it because I think the challenge for enterprises is they hear containers, they generally understand the value of containers, they know how companies like Google have taken advantage of containers and, and built all their applications around it for a, incredible scalability. Uh, HDS, uh, we had the opportunity to, to work with Google and uh, develop uh, our uni unified compute platform to be able to support Kubernetes for enterprises that were wanted to take that path as an option, whether they're going bare metal, virtual machine, or now a container-based deployment. But the reality is, and I'll throw this out to you, Sam, because because I'm going to guess that this, these are the kind of questions you get fielded quite a bit. I don't get the sense that many enterprises are going to be moving quickly to container-based application development. Um, I think I saw some numbers. I'm, I'm speaking purely within your traditional enterprises, maybe 3% within six months to a year. What do you believe the enterprise uptake of, of container-based application development looks like? Uh, yeah, look, so I think that there's a couple of things about containers. They're not new technology. They've been around for, for a very long time. They are a very good idea, uh, and it surprised me that it took so long um, for it to really take off. And it's interesting to hear the story about how it kind of did um, did take off. When, when Amazon first um, uh, introduced their, their custom kernels, you know, I was like, well, look, why don't we have LXC and so on so that we can divide this, you know, 10 cents per hour into 100 slices. Um, and um, But what, where it ended up, you know, kind of really taking off with Docker and so on was for a polyglot patch. And it turned out the patch wasn't the interesting thing. It was the kind of the, the technology underneath that the, the, the means to the end. Um, they're a lot more efficient. You know, you can run a lot more machines because you don't have this overhead of the operating system. The operating system takes up memory, it takes up compute cycles. Um, so it's, it's in many ways, I've written, written about it being like a cancer effectively on your IT system. Um, <laughs> and it, it, um, it, it also creates a huge vulnerability in terms of needing to be patched and configured properly you know, if you could just have the application by itself, uh, then that makes, uh, that makes, I think, a lot more sense. Um, one of the things that makes moving workloads, I've spent quite a bit of time, I wrote a paper on, on migrating workloads around between clouds. Um, in the same way that it's difficult to get a standard operating environment onto a machine, it's quite difficult to move, uh, like, binary images from one, one place to another. So what we're seeing really taking off is using recipes. Um, and if you've got recipes, we, you know, you've got Puppet and Chef and so on, we, we would uh, use a lot of Ansible here, um, but there's many, many different tools you can use to do that, and you can, of course, you can roll your own. Then you can put it into any environment, be it, you know, any, pretty much any cloud or container environment, and it'll go through and install the dependencies and, and everything else you need for your application, um, which gives you a fair bit of that flexibility. Um, in terms of, you know, enterprise adoption of that, it, it just like cloud technologies in general are quite different. You know, scale-out databases are completely different to traditional relational mm -hmm. databases. Um, scale-out, uh, you know, web systems and so on. Web-based application delivery um, is completely different as well. And similarly, containers are very different too. Um, and there's all that, that uh, you know, the challenges around spinning them up and, and equally importantly, you know, turning them down when you're done with them. I mean, that's where companies like RightScale started was a script to go in and turn off Amazon instances you weren't using. You know, if you're not managing it properly, um, and actually one of the things that they're doing in this office here in Sydney is doing a, a lot of the, uh, the the kind of, if you think of agility as like a puppet master for this infrastructure, um, actually going in and um, creating continuous integration workflows uh, which incorporate containers. So, you know, you check your, your code into GitHub or GitHub, GitHub Enterprise, it'll then pull out the code, build it, test it, stick it in a container um, and, and, you know, and away you go. So if you've got those kind of tools to incorporate it into your developer workflow, it makes a lot of sense as well. 
Um, but as for your average kind of, you know, enterprise system and network administrator and so on, I think the uptake will be fairly, uh, you know, fairly limited. Yeah, especially if we're talking about uh, kind of uh, more legacy applications. I think the, the real opportunity here is going to be for the greenfield applications and where they're writing applications uh, fresh and, and, and uh, building new use cases around those applications. You know, JP, one of the, the things that I think there's a common misperception that containers and virtual machines are competitive with each other. Yeah. And especially early on when we see what can, uh, what the uptake is for container-based applications, one of the biggest concerns is networking and security. Yeah. And one of the, 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 the significant value proposition around virtual machines is you can nest the, 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 uh, the containers inside that VM and leverage the benefit of security yeah. and networking. What's, yeah. What kind of inquiries are you getting from customers around that? Yeah, so uh, it, it's funny, you know, about a year ago I was on a panel and I was, uh, was chatting and, and the, the moderator said to me, uh, hey, Docker's going to come and destroy VMware. Uh, and then <laughs> it'll be, that's it. A uh, year on, and I think you mentioned 3% or so is the, is the kind of uptake. Um, we're, we're seeing organizations take advantage of containers where it makes sense, right? So, so what's, that look like? what's, what's a scenario where it looks right? And give me a scenario where well, I, well, I can probably guess what they are. Some of them are right? yeah. So, you know, to, to pick up, you know, a, a core banking system is not going to work and, and try to convert that into these microservices, leveraging containers and things like that. But perhaps, you know, new applications that are around customer engagement, whether that's web apps or, you know, a, a phone app, mobile apps and things like that, certainly um, helps, right? If you look at organizations that are kind of disrupting the normal industries, the Ubers of the world, the Airbnb, you know, they leverage the ability to, uh, you know, spin up, scale up, and scale down their services uh, very quickly, and they're leveraging containers in order to do a lot of that stuff. Um, but going back to your point about security, um, and that's a really big part of it. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why I think that organizations are going to slowly uh, move uh, you know, into these containers. It'll take a little bit longer than what they're originally thinking. Um, VMware or v virtual machines by nature you know, allow for a lot of isolation and segmentation and then you can even start adding in some different security services around the networking piece. So leveraging some virtual switches uh, that, that, that sit within the virtual machines or within the hypervisor, now you can, can start controlling where packets of information go, how the data flows, and all of that that sits within uh, the virtual machine, and obviously containers can sit above that. What we're trying to do now, and, and, and for us, containers are a big deal, obviously, because, you know, who knows, maybe they will eventually <laughs> take over the data center uh, in, in the long term. Um, but what we're working on now is being able to provide or make containers first-class citizens within the data center. So this means, you know, organizations that are highly virtualized, they're already leveraging a lot of technologies, whether it's from us or some of the other virtualization vendors out there, but being able to have containers sit right next to them um, so that the developers get access to these and they're able to, to develop based on containers, but IT then gets to manage them uh, as an enterprise IT wants to manage them, right? And this adds security, this adds being able to segment them out, um, and this is where kind of virtual switching and some of the micro-segmentation topics start coming into this, because now I can start um, isolating out uh, containers by themselves uh, without them actually going back out to the main network. So now I can kind of encapsulate a group of containers, uh, ring fence them off within a security zone, uh, and then that also does uh, additional protection or additional security against the rest of my, my infrastructure that's out there. Who are you typically talking to when, when you talk about these capabilities? Is it the application developer or is it your traditional IT guy? No, so it's, it's totally the application developer. The IT guys, the traditional IT guys want traditional IT. They want the tools that they have. They want the, the, the same kind of infrastructure that they want to use and leverage. They know it very well. Um, the push for containers, the push for microservices, the push for all these cloud native apps is not coming from them. It's coming from the business units which essentially own the application developers and the, you know, the development teams in general. Um, so it's essentially a struggle that we see. We see application developers wanting to be agile. They want all these new containers. They want these new technologies to be able to, to be very agile and, and iterate very quickly as Sam was talking about earlier. 
and it's the IT guys that really want to make sure they have control and, and all this. So essentially, you, you, we're, we're trying to find a way to kind of bridge that gap and give both sides uh, exactly what they want um, without compromising anything. Right, um, and that's why a lot of the challenges, I think not just around virtualization, but cloud, starts with the, the dynamics of, of the folks that you're working with first and foremost before you actually get to the technology and, and how you implement that. So Neil, I saw you nodding your head quite a few times um, through that. It, it, can you relate to, to, to the similar experiences of yeah, that I challenge think, with the IT think part? It's really interesting yeah, from a Hitachi point of view. Our, the way we are seeing our customers reacting to container as such and you know, our, our uh, integration with uh, Kubernetes right now, uh, it's very interesting, uh, and I was just I was I just wrote a paper on this a uh, couple of months back. Uh, I see this is the third shift in you know if you see in last 15 years, I think the early 2000 we saw VMware really coming on and taking on how virtualization is required after the dot com burst. I think we that's where VMware came into being. Uh, in 2008 2009 we saw Amazon picking it up and really making cloud give cloud that cloud name. Uh, cloud was there before as well, but I think Amazon really made it happen. I see that third shift now, uh, which is happening. And uh, as pointed out by JP or even Sam, right, is the market uh, take up right now is slow, low as well. Rightly so. I think people are trying to figure it out. But I think I pick on what JP just said. I think business uh, application owners or business is actually pushing to go towards container. This is exactly the same way what Dropbox did to uh, traditional IT departments. Uh, a lot of customers I see, they set up their BYOD policies because of Dropbox. Till then, they didn't know what his BYOD policy was. And I think containerization is doing the same thing, uh, in a way, to their infrastructure as a service thought process. Uh, what has happened, and one of my good customer, Infosys in India, uh, it's a large IT shop, as you know, Infosys is one of the largest SI companies, okay, do a lot of stuff. And they have our uh, entire unified compute platform to manage their infrastructure from virtual uh, VMware point of view. They also use Hyper-V. And now they want to dabble in containerization, see what does that mean. And good thing what they see with us, that you know I can create different compartments. They can, they can use UCP to do VMware on the same machine, Hyper-V on the same appliance, as well as you know have one more compartment to try their containerization thought process. And bare metal uh, as well. Lot of, yeah, we, we see a lot of take up uh, and uh, uh, I think rather a lot of pilot push is going on with telcos and as banks as well. I think not core banking, but we've seen a lot of customer management uh, or uh, loan management systems. People want to try different things and it's been kind of been very easy. You know, Some of my guys are trying it in the office. In a matter of 30 minutes, you can run and start your application, put, put it on and just run with that. So it's becoming that simple. So it will pick up, it will take some time, but I think as JP said, I think VMware uh, will definitely come up with their thought process around how, how they're going to work around with containerization. So and I think that's, that's what really will make it very interesting and exciting for all of us. Well, it, even from, from our side, even the, uh, the, the white paper that uh, we developed about deploying Kubernetes uh, on UCP, uh, is all based around VMware, and uh, it really is kind of a step-by-step -step guide. If people are interested in that. I encourage you uh, to take a look at that at that white paper. Sam, one of the things that's come up, um, I would say, going back to the spring, uh, and probably before that, kind of behind closed doors, or probably not in such a public fashion, is cloud native application development. How does cloud native application development distinguish itself? from when we talk about containers, or is, it, is it the same thing and it's just a consortium of vendors to support it? Yeah, well, I mean, you can use, you can use containers in, in development, but it makes a lot of sense there because you can spin up an environment and you know, test your new build, uh, even automatically with a continuous integration workflow um, quite easily. You can also use containers in deployment. I mean, we've been uh, you know, putting DNS servers in Chirrut jails for, for decades to you know, keep them safe. Um, or, or at least keep attackers from uh, from you know infiltrating other parts of the system. Um, so they, they they do have quite a few uh, quite a few applications. I think another thing is going in the other direction rather than uh, you know kind of slicing up the operating system um, versus you know slicing up a physical machine using a hypervisor um, is to go down to the bare metal level and you know have an image that you can drop directly onto the bare metal, which I think makes uh, makes a lot of sense as well, and I'm surprised there hasn't been more um, in the way of bare metal cloud. Now, as it turns out, it's quite difficult to do because if you 
you know, uh, get off a machine and somebody else gets on and they've got full access to the machine, they can get in and, you know, look at what you'd previously written to the disk and this kind of stuff. So you have to be pretty careful about how you do it. But it, it does go both ways and it really is just a question of isolation. I mean, we can go, uh, you know, from one end we can go from a, from, from a um, you know, separation level of containers um, and, and using a lot of the Hitachi systems, you know, we can logically separate things uh, using the um, networking, for example, to have different customers on different logical segments. We can physically isolate them within, uh, you know, within the infrastructure, or we can go to the point and say, look, you've got your own physical room, your own cage, uh, which has got its own biometric locks and cameras and everything as well. So it really depends on the, you know, and that's useful for things like government and finance and so on. Um, it really depends on the level of isolation you want. You can dial that up and down um, depending on your, uh, you know, your level of uh, the level of um, generally compliance to, to regulations that you want. Well, you're mentioning regulations and, and compliance there, Sam, and I know, and I'm, I'm probably uh, kind of getting off on, onto a branch here, but I know that there's challenges in Australia now with, with, with new regulations and, and compliance around data control and, and, and data privacy and, and, and security. How do you think yeah. vendors like HDS, VMware, and CSC can best support the challenges that I think some enterprises, it may not be so obvious yet, but I think it's going to become real obvious real fast here for the U.S. because of safe harbor uh, concerns with, yep. with EU, but Australia's yep. got similar concerns, and I know that there's APEC, uh, certain segments of, uh, in Asia Pacific that are also dealing with these with these privacy challenges. How do we work together? How does CSC, VMware, and HDS, how do we work together to help manage the, 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 the challenges that our customers are going to see from this? Well, I mean, the, the obvious answer there is that CSC is the integrator, takes you know, uh, um, HDS hardware and, and VMware software and uh, creates a local cloud, uh, you know, private um, uh, cloud solution for a customer that, that essentially emulates public cloud, but, but, but with uh, the, the level of control and compliance required for the customer. Um, you know, that's kind of the, the obvious answer. I mean, depending on what industry you're in, there's different levels of compliance. A lot of it is actually... Uh, um, I guess perception rather than reality. Um, but but recently, with regulators like APRA, you know, taking an interest in what's going on in the financial services industry, it is uh, it is actually you know becoming real for a lot of these guys. Um, I heard one of the big uh, one of the big banks, I think it was Alyssa, has asked you know for, for references and things. I'm not sure that I can I can um, name them specifically, but you know, they've, they've they've deployed systems on on public clouds, and it's cost them as much. Um, as, as, as what it would to host it internally because of all of the regulation and compliance constraints that they need to have with that. So you know, one of the things for us is how do we um, automate a lot of that compliance? Uh, you know, things like security, your security guys go home at 5 o'clock, you know, they get in at, at 9 o'clock um, and kind of respond to, uh, to pages. But we've got a 24 hour, you know, 24 by 7 security operations center here, which a lot of companies are, are tapping into in order to get that level of compliance as well. So I mean, it depends on the customer. It really depends on the customer and the, and the industry that they're in. Um, but we've certainly got uh, tailored solutions that, um, that that address those those problems. It's also about the most, it's also about the, geo, most, too. Um, the country you're located in and the regulations and, and and how far those go. JP, how often are you running into compliance and security and, and kind of in general data govern, governance concerns from the folks you're talking to? Yeah, it's so, uh, pretty much daily. Um, um, Any time that, that customers start thinking about the cloud, there's, uh, there's data sovereignty laws in certain countries, and, and, and those things get a little bit tricky as to where you can and where you cannot place your data. And this is kind of one of the, the issues that are preventing growth in public clouds in certain markets. You know, For instance, Indonesia doesn't allow pretty much any consumer data or citizen data uh, to be stored outside of Indonesia. Um, and because of that, you know, all the service providers now have to have presences there. Um, so if you're trying to think about these kind of global, pres uh, global providers, right, it gets very expensive for them to, to try to build a presence in every single country in order to support that. Um, for us, our strategy is to, to work with local service providers, whether it's CSE or whoever it might be, in order to enable them to provide those services because they're experts in their own markets, right? So, you know... Sam is going to be an expert in, in all things Australia and New Zealand because it's going, you know, it's their backyard. They kind of understand that space. To have these large multinationals, and including, you know, VMware, it's a little bit tricky to say, hey, we, we, we know everything that's going on in this market, and we're trying to tailor our global solution down to every individual piece. 
Um, so for us, our kind of strategy is, hey, let's work with the folks that are the experts in this area that do have local presence, that do have local knowledge of the laws and the compliance and the governance requirements that are there. You know, here in Singapore, um, you know, for banking, you know, I know in Australia you can you can do certain things in the public cloud. Here in Singapore, uh, the, the the word cloud is the dirty word, uh, and and the the local you know kind of uh, the MAS, the, the the monetary authority of Singapore, says, hey, absolutely no way. I mean, you have to prove to me that my citizens' data is 100% safe. It'll never leave the country. It'll never do this. You know, it'll always be available. Uh, and they make it very difficult uh, to, to start doing it. So having that experts, having that, that local knowledge uh, is really key in order to, to, to hit those requirements. Oh, it sure is. And Sunil, I, you know, I, I know firsthand that these, these are very common questions that we're dealing with. We talk about control of data, data sovereignty, security, and privacy. In fact, I would say as soon as you get past... Um, an IT initiative and the objectives that cover that, that's the very next level of questions, regardless of, of, of what virtualization or cloud technologies you're, you're, you're leveraging. That's the next conversation, isn't it? Yeah. I think uh, I'll give two perspectives around this. I think uh, taking on from JP, obviously every country, most of the countries in Asia Pacific, not just Australia now, but like Indonesia is going down to Philippines. I was just there last couple of weeks back. They want data to be hosted in that country. So to one thing is happening, Amazon so far had a public cloud data center in Singapore and Sydney and Japan. Now Amazon is opening up in India. They are going to open up in Manila next year. Uh, two things are going to happen. The price is going to go up. And uh, customers, are, customers who see that part of it, the moment you put a data center, you put a cost, it's infrastructure, the price is going to go up. And we have seen that happening with Amazon uh, aspect of it. So uh, Sam also mentioned the public cloud pricing when you add data security and other aspects into play, need not be cheaper than having a you know private or a hybrid uh, cloud with your own data center provider. So that's one aspect. Second thing what we have done here is uh, uh, we started working with local cloud providers. So we, we work with M1, say, in Singapore, and they offer infrastructure as a service. We work with CSC Business Cloud to go to enterprise customer. So we kind of segmented the market, and depending on you know who is the customer we want to go to, we offer cloud services. So M1 offer uh, cloud services only for Singapore for mid-tier organization or some local companies. But with CSC, we cover the gamut across APAC uh, to all our enterprise customers where we have an end-to-end play with the biz cloud thought process. Uh, Hong Kong, we have a public cloud like M1. We have a, some similar things that are going on in Australia uh, and uh, on a smaller scale. So we kind of segmented the market to take care of the data sovereignty aspect. But bringing it down to the technology part of it, what we have done, our content cloud technology, we certified it to all local regulations in APAC across the industry. So we have taken a third-party certification from a legal firm in UK, which has produced a document over 200 pages, which if somebody says, tell me, does, does this cover Electronic Evidence Act, uh, this particular thought process, say in Manila or say Indonesia, uh, we produce a document, give it to the customer. Uh, we have a lot of customers in bank, government, who who kind of using private or hybrid cloud thought process working with us. Good example I always give is in Australia, EERD, the research project which has taken up by the uh, uh, research division. You know, they created different pods across seven states, and each pod was about four to five petabyte. It's a public case study. They went after, they publicly announced that how they work with Hitachi around this thought process and how they've created a hybrid cloud environment with us uh, in Australia. Same thing in Korea. We launch a digital locker for citizens uh, to be hosted in Korea with our local data center partner, uh, a complete compliance process been, been in play. So we, we created the compliance thought process, uh, certain features into the technology. By the same time, we created different cloud business model uh, working with uh, partners like CSC uh, or uh, developing certain local cloud providers for mid-tier mid -tier customers. So we segmented the cloud market and then offering a plethora of services to the end customer. So they have the option uh, to work with either go to Amazon or they can work with us, uh, work with us and CSC to look at enterprise, you know, or thought process or, you know, the small and, small and medium enterprise companies in so Singapore can go to our cloud provider in Singapore and take services from them. So that's, that's the way we are looking at this uh, right now. That's fantastic. Well, I think as well, um, 
on that point though, you say, you know, you can go to Amazon or you can go to some solution that we build. You know, the customer that I've just come from, financial services customer, we've been working with them for decades, they, they, they have BizCloud, but they're also, they also have direct connectivity into Amazon and they can use, you know, the right tool or combination of tools for the job. All that managed with agility and so on. I mean, there's another one which is referenceable, which is QBE, who we do a lot of work with and they're like, you know, we've been working with them for three decades and uh, they're like, you know, what's next? So how do we, how do we do, you know, a big part of what we're doing is they know where they want to go. You've got old and you've got new and kind of how can we help get them there? Uh, but then also the, uh, you know, how do we, mod how do we modernize these applications? Um, you know, so, so once you've got this kind of foundation, you know, before you build a house, you build the foundation. Once you've got this foundation in place in terms of these, you know, these multi-tenant data centers that contain this cloud ecosystem, the connectivity to connect in your head and branch offices, the cloud exchanges, um, you know, services that connect cloud exchanges together and so on, you end up being able to get uh, so close to the cloud that it appears like it's part of your infrastructure and it performs as well in many cases and in some cases better um, than the infrastructure that you've actually got in your own data center. Now, one of the things that's happened in Australia, which is which we've been quite lucky, you, you, the you've got the physical the, the constraints of the physical speed of light. So you need to be within a certain distance of your customer to deliver a certain level of app, an acceptable level of application performance of user experience. And as a result, a lot of these cloud providers have actually deployed locally into multi-tenant data centers, um, <coughs> in, including VMware recently. Um, so you can actually come in and be under the same roof. Now, in larger markets. They'll go and deploy in a cow shed in the country and then tether it into the metros. But here, you can actually be, you know, connected to these to these um, uh, cloud providers at tens of gigabits, sub one millisecond latency, which allows you to do things that you just wouldn't have even thought to do. Like, for example, mount, you know, HDS storage block devices into the cloud. Do things like failover clusters from cloud to private, from private to cloud, from cloud to cloud. Um, do you know real-time synchronous replication? Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's a huge uh, variety of architectures that we can build for high availability, for regulations, for compliance, for performance, for dev and test that you, you just wouldn't have even thought to build over the internet. So these are, these are things that we're really just kind of you know, starting to do now, um, but, but there's, you know, there's plenty, of, um, uh, plenty of runway for us to, to, uh, to explore that area. That's fantastic. And you talk about runway and, and, and what uh, looking down the road a little bit. JP, i got to ask you, what's around the corner for, for VMware? What, what should we, and I know you can't uh, spill any trade secrets here, so I won't uh, put you in the hot seat too badly here. But when you're talking to customers and, and kind of laying out the, the vision that VMware has, what does that look like? What's, 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 that, what's that focus for you? Yeah, so, so from a data center perspective, right, our vision, is, our vision remains the same. It's the software-defined data center, and it's essentially, you know, leveraging the same concepts that we've deployed for compute out into storage and networking and really expand that across all aspects of infrastructure. Now, most people go, okay, well, that's on-prem. What about off-prem, and that, how does this relate to the cloud? Um, we think that once you, once you build this software-defined data center, the one cloud moniker that we talked about before really now reigns true. And I can have on-prem, I can have off-prem, I can really build and deploy workloads into anywhere, wherever it's most cost-effective or for compliance reasons or whatever the, the use case might be. Um, so for us, our goal is, is, is that, just, just in that case, right? So one cloud. Um, we also think that we need to, to really put more effort behind the movement of you know third platform apps or bimodal or whatever analyst you like to listen to um, these cloud native applications uh, and and we really need to start helping our customers get from the three percent adoption rate uh, of of looking at containers or whatever it might be uh, and really going forward into that because that's really going to what's drive beyond getting out off the client server and really into this next generation of IT. Now you yeah. can start thinking about adding in things like fintech and Internet of Things and all these other aspects that are technolo you know, technologically very difficult to do today, but um, will be a very important aspect of all, all of our lives in the next, say, three to five years from now. Oh, absolutely. And you, you, you kind of touched, we, we just got a few minutes here, and you touched on a, a really inter interesting subject here. We'll touch on it briefly because we just don't have, we could probably do a whole hour on it. But, Sam, I'm going to throw over Internet of Things on your lap. And how do, how does CSC look at these opportunities? Um, I, I think sometimes you know 
as, as vendors, we, we've got kind of an inside track of where this is going and where the technology is going. And we see the evolution of smart cities. We see the evolution of just these really intelligent platforms and, and decision-making platforms that are just going to completely revolutionize IT and, and business in general for the, in, in the next five to ten years in, in ways that we can't even imagine right now. How is CSC looking yeah. forward on this? Yeah, well, I mean, I guess there's two two kind of areas where you see Internet of Things. We've we've got consumer areas and business areas. Um, so things like smart meters, for example, a lot of that infrastructure has gone in place already, and the applications then really are things like analytics and uh, you know you know how do you um, uh, track and and control and predict spend and so on. Um, uh, then you've got on the you know on the on the, uh, on the industry side. Uh, doing things like you know, there's a lot of a lot of work that, um, that that we've been doing that is being done in the in the mining area, uh, and a lot of it is uh, you know the role of an integrator is to take um, you know parts and integrate them such that this, um, you know the total is greater than the sum of the parts. So you do things like you build a private LTE network, you build in some data storage, analytics, big data, cloud um, components. Uh, to, for, for these devices to talk to, um, and then you can look at doing things like, uh, you know, accurately predicting and controlling the maintenance windows for for you know very expensive machines and this kind of stuff, which translates directly to, you know, huge savings for um, for customers in terms of efficiency and utilization and so on. So there's there's plenty plenty of opportunity there. It really depends on the customer on the customer case, and I think that's one of the things that we really uh, you know, get into is this deep, um, I guess, domain uh, experience um, to be able to do that. Uh, you know, virtualization is a very important part of that. Cloud services, I think, are going to be particularly for consumer applications. Uh, you know, things like it's probably not obvious, but but Nest uh, was built around uh, your Amazon Web Services, and Amazon obviously have released their IoT um, uh, and the kind of the offering uh, at reInvent last week. So there's a lot of interesting stuff mm -hmm. going on there. Um, security is very important. Uh, a lot of work being done on that. Um, Amazon are using certificates for that, for example. But there's there's um, plenty of ways to skin that cat. Um, so um, so yeah, there's uh, there's lo lots of activity. Yeah, there's activity all over the place. And Sunil, for HDS, this is kind of for us one of the, the the things that distinguishes us, I think, from a lot of the traditional uh, infrastructure vendors that are out there. Our social innovation and internet. Of things that matter, strategy, and our, our, our forecast and where we're driving investments inside the business is distinctly different than I think a lot of our competitors are doing. How how are you seeing that? I, and especially in APAC, social innovation, smart cities, these are things that are, are in rapid development, in rapid deployment. We're seeing this firsthand every day. Yeah, I, I think I need another hour <laughs> yeah, to discuss we've, that. We've, I think we've got one minute, so give it your best shot. <laughs> yeah. I think very quickly, but I'll just comment on what Sam said about Amazon launching IoT services. I I, I looked at Salesforce, Dream uh, Dreamforce for uh, the uh, event. They launched their IoT services as well, going beyond sales and marketing cloud. Uh, we see a lot of these new new breed uh, data analytics company like Paxata, Mixpanel, and you see you know plethora of these company just going on a cloud model and you know uh, taking on from that point of view. But the whole idea is IoT is the next big thing and how they look at it. The good part with us, and that's what I like uh, with Hitachi, uh, I just got a note uh, somebody just mentioned about, uh, we all know about EMC Dell acquisition, and uh, somebody said, uh, I just got a quote on IDC saying that by 2020, uh, in our Pentaho world, which just happened, is going on right now, yeah. uh, IDC is saying by 2020, Hitachi will be one of the uh, top three uh, recognized vendor when it comes to IoT, the way Hitachi is uh, developing their social innovation strategy, and they will be the, one it. of the major player in the $20 billion industry, which is kind of shaping up in a different way. It's yeah. a really nice quote uh, coming from IDC on oh, how they fantastic. see this world going together. Uh, well, a lot but of it I does need to be very secure and highly available and so on as well. So you do often need to build your own infrastructure to support these systems, particularly for industrial. Uh, applications, for example. Absolutely. And I think Sam was talking about mining, and I was just working on one of uh, the big uh, RFP coming from mining industry in Australia. And uh, I was like, you know, we have to do sensory analysis around the sludge pump, which is pulling out uh, that mud at a particular time and, you know, goes through that whole process. You know what I had to do? I had to just go and 
figure out, call one of our guru companies who really actually deals in that day in day out, and they gave us the entire spec in terms of how this thing works, and we put the entire solution together end to end with Sledge Pump included uh, for this uh, customer uh, who's thinking about it, and they're like, wow, only Hitachi can talk not just the actual Sledge Pump level uh, discussion, but link it down to the IoT and bring that actual technology data analytics thought process where we have our new acquisition Pentaho coming into discussion. So uh, you have to know that industry. You can't just go and talk IoT at a very superficial level. And with our social innovation, we just launched four solutions right now around telco, around IT analytics, around uh, healthcare, and uh, with uh, our social uh, CCTV and smart city uh, safe community thought process. I think the next phase is connected cars, oil and gas, and mining. So uh, you have to have uh, that knowledge and that expertise, and that's somewhere maybe is our big differentiator uh, going into the market a uh, couple of years from now uh, than pure play IT infrastructure vendor, uh, and I'm very excited about that. I got to draw the line there, guys. We, we, we've gone through the full hour there, so I really appreciate it. First of all, JP, thank you for joining us. This has been thank really you. fantastic. Sam, as always, such a wealth of knowledge and such a wealth of experience. And we're really glad to have you here to help us pull this all together. And finally, Sunil, thank, thank you for the knowledge. And thank you, everybody, to, for that tuned in for this. Again, if you've got any questions, please, uh, even though this, this uh, broadcast is, is wrapping up, please add your questions here. We're going to be checking back here periodically, and we'd be glad to follow up with you on any of those questions. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone.